what are the commonalities among leaders who sustain excellence over an extended period of time. All right, Ryan, fifth time, man. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of amazing that this is the fifth time that we've recorded together, but uh, welcome, welcome back, man. I think you are the number one guest on the history of this show. Well, thank you. When, when was the first? So that's five appearances over how long? Five years. Makes okay. sense. About one a year. You write, you yeah. write a lot of books. So it makes sense. I do. Too. Too. Uh, I don't think we've even actually covered all of the books because I don't no. think we got one for conspiracy, but we've got some of the other ones. So it's good to, it's good to have you, man. Yeah, of course. So in speaking of that, that's how I wanted to start this particular conversation, because I think this is something that you adhere to and something I certainly try. And that is consistency. And I'll relate it to a stoic that you've written about. In fact, okay. the, first, the first one in the most recent book, uh, I'm going to mispronounce maybe every single name today, as okay. you're probably used to. Is it Zeno? It's Zeno. Yes. Zeno. Okay. So his work was not defined by some single epiphany or discovery, but instead by hard work. He inched his way there through years of study and training as we all must. And Zeno said, well-being is realized by small steps, but is truly m no small thing. And this is what I sense is, is it feels to me like a way that you operate. And I think a useful way for all of us to operate is that it's not this grand giant project or epiphany. It's the day to day work, which is what makes you great and prolific. Well, I, pr I appreciate that. And it, it certainly is at least part of my philosophy that that uh, the little things add up, you know, George Washington's favorite expression was uh, many mickles make a muckle. I don't know what that means, but I think it's the same thing, which which is basically like, look, you show up every day and you put in work. And at least for a writer, what happens is if you show up every day and you work on the project, after enough days, eventually a book comes out of the other side of that. So a lot of people sort of go into a project with a lot of excitement, with a sort of a big vision of it. You know, I'll hear people go like, you know, okay, I'm, I'm taking the whole month of December off and I've rent, rented a cabin in the woods and I'm gonna write the book. And when I hear that, it's like, that's just not enough time. That's not how it works. Not only is that like, even if you could work 10 hours a day, that's not enough hours, but it, it's also just not how great stuff is done, particularly ideas. I tend to find like, I'm, I'm about two thirds of the way through my next book right now. And, um, you know, I got hit with, um, I got hit with an idea today that I added back towards the intro. So I'm all the way, but, but that wouldn't ha have happened if the, if the time hadn't elapsed in between the beginning and where I am now. So, so it's not just that it's not just like, Hey, did you work on it a little bit every day, but actually the, the, the being in the project for an extended period, it's like, it's like a team is better at the end of the season than they are at the beginning of the season. Even when you take into account all the injuries and, and tensions and exhaustion, because they now have that, much experience to draw on as a as a cohesive unit yeah the the legendary steve martin said it's easy to be great every once in a while it's kind of like a lucky hand in poker what's hard is to be consistently good night after night after night regardless of the circumstances you find yourself in and in his case he's talking about doing stand-up comedy in some cases to one person in a bar and then you see him be an overnight success 10 years later, selling out arenas. And I sense that is, that is the, the unsexy aspect of the work like you do. And what I try to do here is that it's, it's, it's about doing it day after day. And then that is what leads to the, as, as, as you are now, more, much more prolific work over time and i think this relates to any leader in any position are you willing to show up day after day after day and be consistent no that's that's right i i had manu ginobili on my podcast recently and and uh we were talking about i mean the spurs have have made the playoffs 
since I was, I think, nine or 10 years old, maybe more, um, every single year. Now, obviously, a handful of those seasons were much better than the other seasons. I mean, those are the seasons they went all the way. But I think, you know, a lot of teams, a lot of organizations, a lot of people try to put themselves in a position to make one run, like, like the, 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 the Buccaneers now. They're, they're trying to put together this team to be good for like maybe one, two years, right? The, the Heat were like one to two good years. You know, the Cavs were a few years. Um, I, the, the Lakers are going to be in this little window for a few years. But, but I'm, I'm fascinated and, and much more impressed by the people who are able to build an organization, a set of principles that work over a long period of time. And that's just also just a function of the writing profession. Like, you know, I, let's say I live to be 70, and there's obviously no guarantees. Let's say I live to be 70. It means I got four, potentially 40 more years of this. So, so in a weird way, I am prolific, but I'm, I'm also trying to slow down a little bit and trying to, to perfect the process primarily for purposes of sustainability. So it's less to do with output for me, although I, obviously I like the output and, and, and the output may stay the same, but I'm trying to um, fine tune the process and, the, and what I put into it so that what I'm putting out is living up to those standards each time. There's a stoic you write about that I think is it, it could be helpful for us to dig into. And um, again, I'm going to try my best. Clenthes? Cleanthes. That, Cleanthes, sorry. Okay. So he was um, notable for his continued work. And there's a term, yeah. I believe, called philo philop <laughs> Philoponia. Philoponia. I don't know how to pronounce any of the things either. I've never heard them said <laughs> out loud. Our best. Yeah. Yeah, I know, we, we talked about this last time. There's so many of these words where we only seen them in print. But yes. anyways, the reason why I, I like this is because th this is what the ancients used to describe a love of work. Yes. I, I, I feel very lucky to love the work I do. I think you do as well. And, I, and I've, I've sensed that the only way to be truly excellent over a sustained period of time is to have this phil philoponia, this love of work. And, and Cleanthes is, is one of those examples of someone who did that. And, I, and again, I sense this is, I'm re relating it to your life because I think that's what's most interesting is how the Stoics relate to you and then how that relates to us. And, and to me, um, I feel like that is a critical component to doing, to having sustainable, excellent work. Curious. Yeah, of, co was. of course, it, it, you could almost pity someone who's extremely talented, but, you know, hates baseball. It's like, you know, so you, you, you have this thing and it feels stupid to not, you know, make a go of it, but, and you still have to do most of the work, but, but but you're not gonna go as far as you could and you're not gonna enjoy how far you do end up going because really what you wanna be doing is something else. And so, um, you know, for, for me, what I really like, I, I've started to realize that like, I, I, don't, I don't actually like publishing books. Like I have this book coming out and, and obviously like, uh, you know, we're doing this interview and this wonderful about this conversation, but the, the whole, all the stuff that goes into putting out a book, like, you know, the, the, the printer delays, and then there was this conversation, and then there's how much time do you clear on the schedule? And then, you know, it's like putting out a book in the middle of a pandemic is like a crazy thing in and of itself. It's like, if you told me that I didn't have to do any of it, and I could just go, I could just be focused on the book that I'm working on now, I'd be happier, because primarily what I love is making books. Like, I love the thing, that in, in a weird way, Publishing is not only not even the reward, punishment, or sorry, uh, uh, publishing is the, is, is the tax that you pay for the gift of, of getting to do it. Now, I, I'm a little bit different in that I, I actually also do love marketing. I love the challenge of it. And I've, I've, I've really enjoyed that in other phases of my career. And, and I'm in a position where I don't have to focus as much on the marketing now because I have an audience for my work. But, but the point is like, you got to ask yourself, do you love the outcome or do you love the process? And if you're in a position where the process is more pleasurable to you than the outcome, that's vastly preferable place to be. Mm. 
The book we're talking about is called Lives of the Stoics, The Art of Living from Zeno to Marcus Aurelius. And uh, I, I think a, a natural question is, so this, this as, as I've dug into it, is really, it, it, it's the history of some of the most fam- famous and most well-known Stoics in history. Yeah. And you get deep into the lives of, of each of those, from Zeno to Marcus Aurelius. And I'm curious, what was it about wanting to go deep into each of these leaders, this philosopher, these philosophers, um, because in your other books, you are focusing on, you'll t- tell a story about Sean Green and how he yeah. uses stillness or the obstacle way you're, you're, you're bringing in different type of metaphors. This is really um, showing the history of specific people without much relation to, to stories of today, other than how it could be applied to today. So what made you want to do it this way? So in the, in the other books, I feel like what I'm doing is I'm illustrating the ideas, specific ideas from the philosophy to teach sort of very specific lessons. And, and that's like what I'm working on now in my next book. And, and, but in lives, what I wanted to do was sort of answer this question of like, well, who are the people that came up with the ideas in the first place? And, you know, I think it would be problematic, for instance, if uh, they were enormous hypocrites or just overall crappy people, or if they were totally theoretical, uh, you know, abstract thinkers who were never put in any position to test the ideas that they were talking about. So, so the, the premise of lives is, and, and Plutarch, one of the great biographers of history talks about this. He's, he's saying, you know, like biography is one thing, He's like, but lives are a different lives is like that you can learn more from an anecdote or from a quip or from a single response and a single stressful situation. You can learn more from that than you can from biography. So it literally it's a series of biographies, but I'm, I'm focused. There's so much stuff that's not in the book. And there were even figures in stoicism that I didn't include because they just weren't particularly interesting and there wasn't, there weren't events in their life that taught anything. And so the, the premise of the book is like, well, Zeno, the founder of Stoicism, well, like, how did he come to do it? And, and is there anything about the shipwreck that he underwent that, that put him on the path to awakening that created the philosophy that we can learn from? And then, you know, obviously we conclude with Marcus Aurelius, like, well, this guy was a philosopher, sure, but he was also the emperor of Rome. And so what did he do day to day in that job? Did he live up to the ideas? Where did he fall short? You know, how did the philosophy actually help him become the sort of profoundly respected leader that, that he was even in his own time? I think what it, what it does is it goes from theory to practice. And as David Epstein has said, or he may have quoted others, we are who we are in practice, not in theory, that the actual behaviors, what we actually do on a daily basis makes up us, what a company does, what a business does, their actions are their culture, not what they say. And so to me, that's, that's what this is about is, 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 as if you take this and relate it to the the person who may be watching or listening, Ryan, who is leading within a business, and say, what could I take from lives of the Stoics to actually implement and execute upon within my team to build a better culture, to overperform, right? To do the things that you're supposed to do when you have a business. What are some of the the key takeaways you, you could, you could grab? Well, I think the meta meta lesson here is, and this is a thing that the Stoics talk about from day one, you know, Marcus really says, he says, you know, don't talk. He says, waste no more time arguing what a good man is like, be one. And, and Epictetus says, don't talk about your philosophy, embody it. So one of the things that leaders do is they read leadership books, they, they create brilliant leadership decks, you know, they, they, they come up with the company culture and they think that this is a thing that you talk about. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, like, like I'm, I'm, I'm seeing this now. I, th- I, I'm, I'm, very disappointed, for instance, in, uh, you know, college athletics, you know, all this talk about, 
you know, doing the right thing. These are student athletes. It's more important who you are as a person, blah, blah, blah. And then they're like, uh, I know you guys could all die of COVID, but uh, you know, it'd be really bad for the university if we hit pause on the season. Do you know what I mean? Um, I think you're, you're watching, and this isn't just in athletics. I mean, there's, I think, six universities in the country right now that have had more than a thousand COVID-19 cases. It's in, you are, we are watching across the board at the federal level, the national level, the collegiate level, the administrative, whatever it is, we are watching leaders violate all the things that they've ever talked about. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. like uh, they, they are not putting people first. You know, they are, they are not doing the right thing, even when it costs you. You, you. We are watching, and I realize there are difficult decisions, so I'm not like, being glib about this, but I have seen very few people and in institutions make the right harder choice as opposed to the easier expedient choice. Uh, and, and, and then, um, then these same people are going to harp on, you know, some 19 year old, you know, uh, freshman athlete for not, you know, uh, you know, for, for, for some minor rule infraction. And it's like, why would they listen to you? Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to get back to some of the stories of the, from the book, Chrysippus. Is that right? I, I say Chrysippus, but I, I, I don't think he's around to object. He was introduced to running and yes. it changed, it changed his life. You are either walking or running daily. Uh, yes. how has, how has running and physical exertion made you better at your craft? You know, I was talking to, to Eric Burns uh, about this the other day that, and I, I think a difficult crisis like the, the one we're in now, you know, I'm seeing people say stuff like, well, how much longer can this go on? Or we can't do this forever. And I think one of the things you learn about in, in, you know, endurance sports is like, all of that is irrelevant. Like, like a marathon doesn't care that you're tired at 20 miles. Like, you got six miles to go. You can quit or you can keep going, but no amount of arguing is going to shorten the race, right? Like it's either a marathon or it's not, right? The time to beat is either a minute flat or it's not. No, you know, pre-existing condition, no argument, no special exemption allows you to change that. And I think one of the things you learn training, whether it's running or swimming or, you know, uh, weightlifting, is that your mind wants to quit much earlier than your body physically has to. And so you have to learn how to push past that. Obviously within reason, there's certainly you know, recklessness and, and, and burnout is real and dangers and all of that. But you have to understand that just because you feel like you're done doesn't mean that you're done. And the more you cultivate the muscle you know, David Goggins talks about this. He's like, when you think you're done, you're at like 40%. And, and that's an idea that you can understand intellectually, but unless you've really pushed yourself in some sort of competitive context or, you know, unless you've really cultivated that willpower and seen that that's true in your experience, you don't really understand that idea. How does this make you better in non-physical work? Like well, writing, I mean, speaking. Yeah, sure. Sure. Like, so a book is a marathon and a sprint, and it requires so much more of you than you want to have to give. Like, you would like it to, you submit, I'm sure you went through this with your book. You're like, you killed yourself to do it. And you're like, this is the bet. There's a story about Henry Kissinger where, like, um, uh, an aide came to him with, like, a, a briefing he'd asked for, and he he grabs it and he, you know, he, he looks at it and uh, he goes, this is garbage, go redo it. And then they bring it back and then he calls him back and this is garbage, go redo it. Then a third time, this is garbage, go redo it. Then they bring it a fourth time and he says, now I'm ready to read it. He hadn't actually looked at it the first four times, the first three times. And the, the point being, um, we think there that we've done our best, but in reality, we've been holding something back. 
And so, you know, you go through this with books, you're like, this is the best I can do. And then somebody looks at it and they go, well, what about this, 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 and this. And you have to, that, that's a choice, right? You have to say like, no, 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 I'm done. I can't do that. Or you have to say, actually, I do have the ability to answer all these questions. And the book becomes 4% better for that process. And that, that is that is the way that work is done. I mean, you know, you, you think you made it all the way, you know, you gave everything and then, oh shit, the game is tied at, you know, when the clock at zero and then there's another quarter, like that's just how it works. And so it's not just a physical thing, but it's, I think in all, almost everything requires more of you than you would like it to have required. When you look at, uh, let's, let's pick uh, the obstacle is the way. Yeah. Uh, there's been some time, some time has passed since you published that you are a better writer today than, than you were when you turned that book in. Yes. Definitely. Do you, do you have moments where you look at it and you're really mad at yourself or you're upset? Cause you're like, God, that, I, that, that is not like you pull a paragraph or a page or even a chapter and it's like, Oh, I, I could have done so much better. Or do you, are you just like, you know what? That was then it's done and I've got to move forward and, and not look back. It's a little of both. I'm having a weird experience right now. My, my, uh, my son asked me to read them to him and, and they seem to work very well at putting him to sleep. <laughs> uh, and so like when I read him, like, so like last night we read Curious George but when I'm reading Curious George, he wants to pay attention and he wants to look at the pictures. It's like, it's, it's a fun thing to do. And so as soon as I close Curious George and I open the obstacles the way, you know, he's asleep, you know, like that because uh, he doesn't have any idea what's happening and, and it's much more boring than I'd probably like to admit. But I've, I've had the weird experience over the last few months rereading both, I, I haven't done stillness, but I've reread uh, Obstacle and Ego. And the last time I'd read those two books was when I recorded the audio book for them. So um, I think I, I definitely see uh, things that I, you know, I, I feel like I was a little bit too glib about or that, you know, there, I, you know, I talk about Ulysses S. Grant uh, it, somewhat negatively and ego is the enemy. Uh, and and as, I've, as I've studied him more, I, I've come around and maybe I'd have nuanced that chapter a little bit, for instance. So there's definitely things you see where you're like, I don't know if I totally agree with that as much anymore. Maybe I'd change this or that. But one of the things and I'm thinking about this now as I'm writing my book, with as I've got, as I become a better writer, I've also become, become more informed and more aware of what's possible with each sentence. So on the one hand, that that improves the quality, but but when I read obstacle, like uh, ego is probably 15% longer than obstacle and stillness is probably 15% longer than ego. And so when I read obstacle, there's a quickness and an and authenticity to it and an, a sort of an, I don't want to say unpretentiousness because that's not really the word, but there's a, there's a, there's a looseness to it that that i appreciate in the way that like you listen to a band's first album it just tends to be quicker and less self-conscious and so uh i'm i'm trying to think about that more like not how do i go back to it but you know it would be if every one of your books got longer and heavier and more deliberate at a certain point that's not sustainable either i want to talk about community Okay. Uh, it's partially why we're doing this today with, with friends along, um, in, in, in Rome, um, Panicius, Gaius, uh, I think I, we'll call him Panateus. That's, Panateus. What, that's what I call him. I looked it up on Google and, 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 and that's how they did it. So I, this is, this is a fun exercise in trying to be, to pro properly pronounce names. Anyway, there were three people. One of them was a, one of the Rome's great generals and they yes. formed kind of a philosophical club. Um, and this, this is also similar to what Benjamin Franklin did with his junto, yep. um, where they would meet, they discuss and debate the stoic philosophy they all pursued. And to me, I have found one of the greatest benefits in my work 
is regularly meeting with small groups or leadership circles to have these conversations to go deep on a specific topic to get a, a, a variety of point of views from a variety of places in the world sure. and to hear and to learn through dialogue. And I feel like this is something that is is a a powerful thing that I I wish everybody I know you go on a trip with some of the best writers in the world you guys go off to a house and and do physical things outside together um, and that's part of a, like your your version of a junto I think this is a critical component to prog to progressing to learning to improving I'd love to hear your philosophy on it and and maybe share a little of the story too from uh, from ancient Rome. Yeah, so it was called, and I'm actually writing this down because you gave me an idea. Um, sorry, they, they, it was called the 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 Scipionic Circle, and the Scipionic Circle was a collection of the sort of greatest philosophical and political minds of of its time, and they would get together and talk. and And it's a you know we tend to think of the Stoics as these kind of solitary, lone, you know, joy hating. Uh, you know, introverted figures. And that's just the opposite of what they were. I mean, Cato, who famously, uh, you know, takes his own life in protest of Julius Caesar, his last meal was a, a big philosophical discussion with all his friends. And that was a tradition he'd observed all of his life. He, he worked constantly. So the only real time he had uh, for friends was, was over dinner. And he would, he, but it wasn't just like, Hey, let's gossip. It was like let's let's talk and debate the, the big questions of life, and and this goes back really to the founding of Stoicism. For people, it's like what is Stoicism? You know, most philosophies were named after the person who founded it, right? So Stoicism is not called Zenoism. Stoicism is called Stoicism because Stoa is the Greek word for porch which is where the Stoic, the, the, they started on what's called the painted porch in Athens. And I, I just love the, even the image or the symmetry of the idea of Stoicism being named after a porch, which is a, you know, an open air structure. It's where, you know, it, it, there's no doors on it. You know, it's, it's facing the, the city, it's facing people, anyone can come up on it. And, and, and it, it, it's, so it's like this idea of like, well, what is your stoa? Like where, where who, who's on it and where is it? Where are you having these discussions? I, I, yeah, I'm a big fan of like mastermind groups. I'm a big fan of, you know, I'm on a couple different, I don't know if you had this, but like text threads with different people in different professions. And it just allows people to kind of dip in and dip out and benefit from it, you know, uh, you know, different people's perspectives. But most of all, you want to be benefiting from other people's experiences. And so, what these groups really let you do is you go, hey, you know, I'm trying to find someone to redesign my website. Has anyone gone through this? Or, you know, like I, I'm uh, on, on some of my books, there's been some some issues with the printers, like the, the, the printers are overloaded. And so, you know, I'm going to text this group today and be like, hey, is anyone else at other publishers having this problem? And how did you solve it? And And so I think just the ability to share and benefit from other people's wisdom is really, really important. What's it like when you go <coughs> do, do one of your trips? I've, I've talked to James a little bit about this, James Clear, and, uh, um, and I've had some of the other, the other guys that go on this trip. Yeah. What, what, what are those, those, those offsite retreat-like events like for you guys? Well, uh, James deserves all the credit because he's the one that put it together and, and, you know, he just invited a bunch of folks and it seemed like fun the first time. I didn't really know what to expect, but, um, you know, writing is a, a strange profession in that, you know, you're competitors, but you're not really competitors. And, and uh, even though you are competitors, you probably all benefit from sharing more than you do from from uh, stockpiling. I, I spoke at a couple, couple years ago in Austin, uh, I got invited um, uh, by an, uh, an AD, I won't say from what school, but, but the athletic director at a big school was like, hey, we're getting a bunch of other ADs together. And I, I, you know, I went to this house, it was like the house of one of the donors uh, for the program. Anyways, the point was there I was and there were the, there were the ADs from like, 10 schools that all 
are constantly trying to destroy each other and beat the crap out of each other on the football field, steal like, you know, that, you know, this, that their coaches are trying to, to recruit athletes away from each other. They're fighting over ostensibly a finite amount of advertising dollars and, and television rights and whatever. And yet for like 20 years, these coaches have gotten together and shared with, and sh not coaches, ADs have gotten together and shared with each other what they're learning, what's working, what's not working. You know, one of them gets fired and the other one's helped them get a job somewhere else. It, it was just really interesting to see. So I think the more you, the more you sort of, get up close and personal with elite performers, whether it's in sports or the management of sports or business or, or the armed forces, you find that there's a lot more sharing uh, than you might expect. And, and I think that's what allows them to continue to grow and improve. It, it reminds me of the word, uh, I'm going to spell it, you can pronounce it, O-I-K-E-I-O-S-I-S. That we share something and our interests are naturally connected to those of our fellow humans. This is, this is it was pressing uh, in the ancient world and it certainly is today. And I feel like that is, is something that I wanted to bring up and talk about and have you expand on and, and pronounce it properly for me. Uh, because I actually don't, don't remember <laughs> how to pronounce it, but, but the, the, it translates to like the, a mutual affinity that we have a mutual, a natural affinity, a natural almost altruism. And then what happens is we, we lose it. We, we, beat each, we beat it out of each other. Or we pressure it out of each other. And uh, it's the root of, of so much pain and unnecessary difficulty. Mm -hmm. I think people, uh, are, I mean, look, I think, I, I think that's been one of the, the, the saddest parts of the pandemic is like people, it's like, you can't seem to get people to care about other people. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. we don't even have to get into the mask thing. But, but you know, you'll hear people say things like, uh, you know, those 200,000 people would have died anyway. Or they go, you know, a huge percentage of them had pre-existing conditions. And it's like, I, I, do, you not, do you not hear how horrible you sound right now? Like, I mean, not only is it not true, but, but like, what, it's just, it's just heinous. Do you know what I mean? It's just heinous to, 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 that we've gotten to a place where we're so callous and we're so self-interested that we, we can't even understand why it's bad that, that these people have died. And, and you, the, the weirdest part is you can, you could make an, a very strong self, and this is what the Stoics do, a very strong self-interested case. I mean, mm -hmm. we've lost doctors, we've lost artists, we've lost, you know, people's grandparents, we've lost caregivers. There's going to be orphans from this, right? And that has a profound cost that ripples through society. And, and that's, that's something the Stoics talk about over and over again, that we're all part of this large organism and that to harm one person is to harm all people. To cheat is to cheat yourself. And, and that you just, you just have to care. Like you just have to care. And if you don't care, then you have to work to make yourself care. Um, and and uh, that, that's been the hardest part for me to grapple with is just people that I know are, I, either I believe we're good people or I know deep down are good people just expressing like abhorrently callous indifference to the, the suffering and loss that we're still probably not even halfway through. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you wrote a piece, I'm with you, you wrote a piece titled uh, The Maxim for Every Successful Person. And I think it flows well with, with what I believe in here. And that's is that's that's to always stay a student um to yeah. always put yourself in the position of of being a learner and my favorite leaders in history my favorite leaders i've worked directly with are those who are they always have this strong belief that they will be better tomorrow than they are today because of or at least they'll be better when they go to bed at night than they were when they woke up because of their intentional purposeful action towards learning, towards growing, towards improving. And there's some misconceptions even about like Genghis Khan, who 
um, that, that, that maybe this wasn't him, but, but you've written about the fact that he was one of the greatest learners in history. And I'd love for you to share that story because it, it could be misconstrued by people who haven't studied enough about why one, that's the maxim for every successful person, maybe specifically about him. Yeah, that's a chapter in Ego is the Enemy. And, and really, the, the argument that I'm making against ego is, is not that it's, you know, unattractive or unappealing or whatever. It's that it, it, it makes you vulnerable. It ossifies you. There's a great line from Seneca, or sorry, from Epictetus, who's one of the Stoics. He says, it's impossible to learn that which you think you already know. So great leaders are humble and students because they realize that it's a self it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you think that there's more left for you to learn, you will keep learning. If you told yourself that you've, you've figured it all out, you've certainly figured all that it is possible for you to figure out. And so, yeah, the, 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 look, the Socratic method is about you know, asking questions and Socrates was considered wise because of, you know, he knew what he didn't know. Um, the scientific, you know, sort of method is about a guess that you then go see if it's true. Like you, you say, here's what I think, but that's not the end of it. Then you have to go conduct experiments that, that you're really trying fundamentally to disprove what you think. And so, yeah, great, great leaders are focused on learning. Um, there's a great story about Marcus Aurelius. Uh, I, I think it's in lives. If it wasn't, it's only because uh, I didn't have room for it. But you know, he's an old man at this point, uh, and, and one of his friends finds him leaving uh, his palace and walking on foot, which is, you know, very unusual for the emperor at that time. And, uh, and he says, where are you going? And, and Marcus says, I am off to the house of Sextus the philosopher to learn that which I do not yet know. And so, and, and the, the, the man supposedly ex explains like, how like this is the most powerful man in the world and he's going to learn at the feet of an old philosopher and and to me that's what leadership looks like and and i mean the really crazy weird story is sextus was plutarch who i mentioned earlier was plutarch's grandson um but but marcus and marcus thanks sextus at the beginning of meditations for for all that he learned from him and so you know this relentless focus on learning and uh, and finding out what you don't yet know is is the is the key to greatness, I think. Love it, Ryan. I'm going to open up to some questions sure. here. We got some uh, big fans. First, uh, happy early birthday to Joe Nykirk. Uh, his wife Emily texted me and said this would be really cool if uh, you could get Joe to talk directly to Ryan because he's I think, right. read pretty much every word you've ever written. So, Joe, how about you? Uh, you take it away, man. Appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Ryan. Thanks, to Ryan, as well. My wife just told me that on the way up here, we're on a family trip and uh, she's right though. I appreciate it. I, I've read all your books, get the Daily Stoic, uh, read the Daily Stoic every day and Daily Dad. So thanks for all you do and all your work. Appreciate it, uh, man. Yeah. And, and I mean, I think close to the topic that we were just talking about um, with that word we couldn't pronounce, but you know, with, with, with courage, justice, wisdom, and temperance being, you know, the four Stoic values, especially in, in this day and age with how divisive I feel like the environments are today with just everything, you know, racial injustices and, and the pandemic. H how have you found ways or what methods do you have to balance, especially temperance and justice? I feel like, you know, fighting for what is right, but also letting things kind of go and, and maybe yeah. not getting into arguments you don't want. How do, how do you balance those things? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's really difficult, right? It's like you could spend your whole day, you know, just angrily tweeting about things and that might make you feel good, but what is it accomplishing? It, it, and, and, and how quickly do you end up sort of losing hope if, if that's the strategy you do? So yeah, it's a balance. Like how do you sort of maintain your, your sanity, your moral compass, you know, amidst a world that feels maybe a little bit like it's tearing itself to pieces and then at the same time, not give up and not just sort of tolerate the status quo. I think, I think that's, the, the, that's the struggle that a lot of us are in right now, my, myself included. I think, you know, first off, it's, uh, you know, how do, we, how do we start just by, you know, being better ourselves as people? How do we start, you know, we can have the most impact at home with our own children, for instance, 
So I think that's good. Um, obviously, you know, uh, as a writer, you know, how do you, how do I use my platform to make a difference? But then just as, as a citizen, like, you know, where do you draw the line? Where do you say like, that's not okay with me. I'm not going to be complicit in that particularly. And I think this is the struggle that a lot of people are having. Um, particularly, you know, particularly when it's not in your interest to do so. Right. So like, um, you know, there's a joke, like it's only a principle if it costs you money. Um, you know, I think people are, people are, you know, I see people that are like, Hey, you know, social distancing, you know, you shouldn't wear a mask, blah, blah, blah. And then, and then as soon as, as soon as that sort of limitation impacts their career in some way, it goes like right out the window. So, you know, sort of what are you, what are you willing to sacrifice or pay to insist on the, the, the formula or the, or the standard by which you believe? And I think that's where we can start. If, if each person just didn't do things that violated, you know, what they believe to be their conscience, that would exert an immense amount of pressure systemically. But, but we have trouble doing that. I think everyone just thinks like, oh, we have to solve this like on the national level, on the international level. But really, I think if we focused on like, well, what am I, where am I drawing the line? What am I okay to do, not okay to do? And I'm going to enforce those boundaries and ethics in my own personal life. Like whether it's like, hey, look, I have people would be better if I had them come work in my office, but I don't feel good about that. And I don't feel good about asking someone to do that. So I'm not going to do it. Right. And, and so like, I think that's a good place to start is just what are you going to do with your own personal behavior? Love it. Thanks, man. Uh, Liam, are you good to go next, man? Yeah, you got me right there. Yeah, go ahead. Yep. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, so something in, in my company, but I, I've noticed it's just been an aspect of my whole life, has been um, trying to figure out, you know, you started at a very young age of, of what do you want to be when you grow up, who are you going to be when you grow up, and now... Um, in, in the business that I'm part of, we think a lot about how to get people in the right roles and, and what do they want to do with their careers and what do they want to go on to be even after our company. And I had the opportunity to visit with my, uh, my grandfather, who's 97 and very fortunately still lucid. And we were talking a little bit about his career. He had this kind of weird career path kind of going from the Marine Corps to uh, a machine shop and then ultimately to selling records. And I asked him, I said, you know, what kind of made you choose that career path? And in the way my grandfather does, it was just sort of, well, I had to eat and they had a job. So that's why right. I did it. And it kind of got me thinking that we're to the point now where this, we have this incredible luxury of thinking about what we're going to do with our careers. But from, from your perspective or the Stoic tradition, um, have we almost put too much weight on that of exactly what it is you're going to become and thought less about the day to day and, and really how you're living your life day to day. No, that's a that, I think that's a great question. Yeah, you, you do find people are sort of, they can be sort of paralyzed, like, this isn't my dream job. This isn't exactly what I want. And, you know, if they just sort of chose and committed to it, they might be able to make it into that thing. And so a, a lot of sort of millennials I know have kind of bounced from thing to thing. And, and, and sort of never really found their footing. At the same time, like I do, I do uh, to go to your other point, I do find with my employees, it's like, if, look, it's like, we both know you're not going to work here for the rest of your life. So if you can be much clearer with me about what you want to do, like where you see yourself going or what kind of life you want to have, work, this is going to be a much more fruitful relationship for both of us because I can help you. Right. It's like I can only pay you what I can pay you, but I can give you all sorts of advice and guidance and send opportunities your way um, that are going to be worth a lot more than what I'm paying you. But I can only do that if you help me get a sense of what that is for you. And so I think a lot of people struggle with with thinking about that and then communicating it. And then it's sort of a suboptimal relationship for everyone involved. It's like, if I have a research assistant who is like, I want to become a writer someday, 
that's so much better for me than a research assistant who's just sort of like, well, I don't know, you know, maybe I want, you know, it's like, if I can, tr if I'm specifically training you for a thing, that's much better than if, if, if this is just like, you know, uh, a transactional relationship, you know what I mean? So I, I think it's like all things, probably a mix of both. Good stuff. Thanks, man. Yeah, I, I found that um, I know you're friends with Cal as well, Newport, yeah. or, or, and and his his kind of be so good they can't ignore you. Yeah. Especially, I think when you're getting started. To me, it was really helpful just to be kind of grateful that somebody gave me a job, even though it was making eighty cold calls a day. Yeah. And it wasn't that fun, but but the desire to get good at something that I had never done before has now helped me in everything else I've ever done. Like learning how to sell is a critical skill and a component sure. that I'm so grateful for, even though there are a lot of parts of that job that were awful, but were very rewarding and potentially lucrative if you did well, like one of those tiny base salary, high variable compensation jobs. So sure. not only that, and so I think you could learn some skills through saying, this isn't like my dream job, but I'm going to work to be excellent at whatever job I'm lucky to have. Yeah, that's, that's right. Uh, hey, you know, this isn't my dream job, but what I want to learn from this, you know, two years I'm here is X, Y, and Z. And that becomes, you know, just a much more straightforward transaction than the, well, I don't want you to, you know, like it just, when people are clear about their intentions, I think just everyone's better off. Yeah, agreed. Um, okay, Nikki, you good to go? Yes, yeah. all right. Hi. Hey, Ryan, hello. Um, so as a student of Stoicism, thanks to Joe, I am a huge fan of your work. Um, I'm excited to ask you, so what was your personal turning point or moment where you began this sort of Stoic journey? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, you could go to when I was first introduced to Stoicism, when I was in my, uh, I think I was 19 or 20 years old, and I, I just asked someone for a book recommendation, and, and that's how I got turned into Stoicism, which ironically is sort of how Zeno is introduced to Stoicism, which I talk about in the book. Um, but, but, you know, what's, what, what's been interesting for me is how the books have evolved over time. So, you know, I, I was talking about Sextus the philosopher earlier. I, I've probably read Marcus's little section on him like 30 times. And it was only recently that one, I even made the connection between him and Plutarch and, and that there, there was a passage that really struck me that I've been trying to apply in my life. The point being that when the journey begins is important, but I'm, I'm also as interested in how the journey evolves and how one kind of recommits to it. And, and it's like, if you see the texts as static, you're, you know, then, then you're going to read them one time and you're going to retain whatever you retain. And that's the it, and that's it. If you see it more as this sort of continual thing you're engaging with, the Stoics talk about how we, we never step in the same river twice. You see it that way, then it's this sort of almost constantly renewing thing, this expanding thing. And, and, that's kind of more how I see the journey. Love it. Good stuff. Uh, thank you, Nikki. Tom, you good to go? I am. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yep. All right. Great. Well, thank you. Thanks, Ryan, for mm -hmm. being the prolific writer that you are. Um, so I just recently finished reading Deep Work. It's interesting that uh, you mentioned Cal Newport just a few yeah. minutes ago, but um, you know, a lot of the strategies did resonate with me and I'm, I'm just wondering if you could share some of your best practices, you know, routines, what have you for um, getting into that creative and productive uh, mode, um, you know, with every, with us. Yeah, for, for me, it's, it's all about the morning. So like this morning I, I got up at like six, that's when my kids woke up. First thing we did was we went for a long walk together I didn't check my phone probably, so let's say I got up at six, I probably touched my phone for the first time at like 8.15. 
uh, you know, didn't check my, my email email until I was, you know, at the office. Um, and then the first thing I did was go sort of right into the work and, and worked probably from, you know, eight to 11 or 12 o'clock. So like for me, I mean, I have a bunch of crap on my to-do list I have to do today, but it's all extra like administrative stuff that if it gets pushed till tomorrow or the next day, so be it. But like the main writing thing I had to do, the primary creative, like thinking task, it's already done. And it was done almost, you know, before, you know, the mid morning had passed. And so, so for me, my deep work stuff is just like, get up early, you know, go right into it and then do it in an, in as uninterrupted and continuous form possible. Good stuff. Um, thanks. thanks. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Ryan, one of the commonalities between you and all the Stoics is that at least most of them were prolific writers. Um, and I've, I've been pushing this lately because of what I learned through the process of, of turning in a book on time and, and, and getting the edits and then rewriting. And just, the, just I, I think I fully realized how much I learned through the process of having to write every single day. And I feel yeah. like that is, a, that is a, a skill and an exercise that every leader who wants to influence teams to outcomes should do. It's worth it. What, what, would, what advice do you give to people in leadership positions as to, and, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but at least I believe they should write. I would assume you do. Um, leaders seem to, to be able to get their words out in a cogent way to move people. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, writing as a practice is, is a deeply sort of meditative experience. It forces you to clarify your thinking. It forces you to marshal the evidence for your thinking, forces you to communicate succinctly and directly. Look, there's a reason like at Amazon, they don't want you to give like PowerPoint presentations about, you know, this initiative or that project. You have to write it in a, like a long form memo letter kind of a thing. You have to make your case. And so I feel like a lot of leaders are just sort of, you know, they're just kind of like shooting from the hip. They're like, well, I got to do this phone call. So I'll say this. And, you know, like I, I much prefer, like I actually love email as a medium because it's like, I'm, no, I'm going to lay my thoughts out here and I'm going to put it down in a way that, you know, the facts are there. Um, when we're doing this on the phone, what's, well, you know, somebody doesn't want to hurt somebody else's feelings or, you know, somebody, the perception is breaking up or whatever. I, I think writing as a practice is really important and, and as a way of clarifying one, even if it, even if the writing is never seen, the, the, the purpose of clarifying your own thinking is, is beneficial in and of itself. Yeah, Ryan, one more question before we uh, come to the end here. Yeah. Uh, I com com completely agree. And I would urge everyone, even though it's painful, and it hurts, and especially like I regularly work with an editor, because for me, at least, even if I don't publish the words I'm having edited, it creates positive momentum to see my words and my thoughts look better. That yeah. may be weird. But but that that to me getting that critical feedback sent back to me, and then I say, Oh, my stuff actually isn't that bad. Like, yeah. it's, 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 it. And I, so I think if it, it, that's a good practice to get into for anybody who cares to be an excellent leader, because I'm a firm believer to be an excellent leader, you have to be able to communicate your ideas in a compelling way in both the written and spoken, spoken word. Um, so you wrote a post, I don't remember when it was published, but it's called advice to a young man hoping to go somewhere or get something from someone successful. So you, it, and it starts with when you dropped out of school at 19 to start your first job in Hollywood, there are, I've, I've, as I've asked this, this question to a lot of people, Ryan, I've noticed that the advice that people give to a 19 year old or a 24 year old, who's a new college graduate, is usually useful for all of us. And yeah. so given your career and you're still young, you probably get just bombarded with advice from people who are younger. What, what are some of the general life principles slash pieces of advice 
you share when 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 you're posed with that question? Um, you know, honestly, I don't remember what's in the article, but I, I'll tell you something I've been thinking about recently that I get a lot of, and so people will go like, you know, people think mentorship's important, so they'll they'll ask someone like, "Hey, will you be my mentor?" Or they 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 go like, uh, "I want a relationship with this person," so they're like, "Hey, you know, I'm following your stuff. Like, can we get on the phone and maybe talk?" Or you know, like, the the one I'll, the one I get the most is, is or the, that drives me the nuts the most is people go, "Hey, blah blah blah." you know, blah, 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 can I ask you a question? And, and what I've never understood about this and what's it, because I've, I've never seen that work is like, why don't you just ask the question, right? Like you wouldn't walk up to a pretty stranger in a bar and say, hey, can I, can I talk to you for a while? They'd be like, what are you talking about, right? You would, you would, that's not how conversations start, right? Like the way you start a relationship with someone who's your mentor is with an exchange of an idea of ideas. So it would be like, send them a link to an article or ask them a very quick question. Like, you know, like that was how I got introduced to stoicism. I, I asked uh, somebody like what their favorite book was. And, and so, so like the way you start these relationships, the way you learn, the way you get access to, you know, a, a, a busy person's time is not asking them for a 20 minute coffee. It's asking them a two second question that, that then can begin the, like the, the germ of a relationship. And so, you know, it's like, I always respond, uh, you know, when people like, like when they go, Hey, can I ask you a question? I'm like, you just asked me a question. Like you wasted your question by asking if you could ask a question. If you'd, it, you got me to open this email, and you 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 now want me to reply so then you could send me another email that's twice as inefficient right and so i think that the, the main thing i think about is like the way you start relationships is by starting relationships it's not by asking for a relationship right and so i think people miss that and be direct yeah. uh, and i think it's helpful to um to have done something that uh, to, to create a reason for somebody to potentially be interested in you. Uh, sure. I think being a great writer, having a good podcast, um, putting, putting your work out there publicly opens the door to potential new friends that you want to talk to. Yeah. You've shown a, an ability to add value to the world. That is a great networking tool to, to gather and build real relationships because it's like, Hey, I dig what you do. Oh, I dig what you do. I think it's Jordan was, yeah, Jordan's still on the call. You know, he's a, he is assistant coach with the Brooklyn Nets. And yesterday, all of a sudden Steve Nash gets hired and I'm thinking, Oh my God, Jordan, what's going on? And we're texting about, about what you're working with Jacques Vaughn and now how's that going to work? It's because he, he has a job of significance that I'm curious in. He originally sure. reached out to me because of the podcast and now we formed a relationship over a mutual respect. And I think that's another key aspect. If you want to build those relationships, do something worthy of it. And I, and that's a way that I've found that has been the, one of the coolest parts of doing this. No, totally. Cheryl Sandberg has talked about this. She says, people think like, find a mentor and you will do well. She's like, do well and a mentor will find you. It's like, if you do interesting things, if you're showing promise, you will have no shortage of potential relationships. It's like, if, if, if you won't need to go ask people for things because, you know, these things will naturally ensue from this sort of incoming, I might call it deal flow that, we're, that you're, you're, you're experiencing. And so, yeah, do it. And, and, and when we talked about jobs earlier, like when people are thinking about, should I do this opportunity or this opportunity? I, I go like, well, what's the one that's going to, you know, be the most interesting. That's going to teach you the most. It's going to get you the access to the most things. And so, uh, I think people people underestimate the value. Like they're thinking about where they want to go to college. It's like, look, do you want to go to a college, you know, in New York City, where you're going to be exposed to all these things, or do you want to go to a college in the you know in the middle of Iowa, where you're not going to have any access to anyone doing in anything? You know, so I think thinking about what's going to give you proximity is uh, is a is a great um, you know a, a great tool for this as well. Love it, Ryan. Thanks so much, man. It flew by. Number five. Uh, already looking forward to number six. Where would uh, you send 
uh, people to, to learn more about you online? Uh, RyanHoliday.net. And then I do a, a daily stoicism inspired email at uh, dailystoic.com. Most recent books titled Lives of the Stoics, The Art of Living from Zeno to Marcus Aurelius. Uh, are you talking about your next one yet or is it still a secret? Oh yeah, no, I, I sold I sold the next four and I am uh, about two thirds of the way done with the first one. The next four? Is it another four. like series like? Uh... Yeah. Oh, are you going to share a little I more? I can't tell you. I'd have to kill you. All right, we'll talk about it next time, I'm sure. Next so. time. All right, man. All right Thanks man. so much for being here. It's great to talk to you again. See ya. See ya.